Coming in at number five, we've got Puriel. Not to be confused with the top tier hand sanitizer, although I wouldn't be too mad if you made that mistake. This angel does a similar job to the alcohol based cleaning solution. He purifies and eliminates all sorts of unsavory things. Whether or not that's 99%, I can't be sure, but here we are anyway. His job is one that not many would really want to do. Puriel is the angel of punishment. One would think that once you made it to heaven, there wouldn't really be a need for that kind of thing, but apparently we're wrong. He watches over the prison in heaven, acting as the warden. Who knew? He's also responsible for examining each and every soul that makes it up to heaven after dying. During this spot check, he makes sure that the soul is pure enough to be allowed to pass through. Kind of like a TSA check at the airport, but somehow more invasive. Instead of checking your passport and your luggage and making assumptions based on your appearance and background, they're instead reaching into the depths of your soul. Talk about a cavity search, am I right? If you are fit to enter heaven, he will let you pass, although I'm not so sure you'll be the same person after an experience like that. Fail the test, and out you go. Down to hell, or possibly purgatory, to cavort with all sorts of other unworthy individuals. Damn, so close, too. Puriel is known for being fiery and pitiless, too, so don't count on just barely squeezing by. If he doesn't like what he sees, he's gonna drop you from the clouds faster than you can say bless you. Dang. Maybe he does have a lot in common with Purell. I'm sure he eliminates 99% of potential heavenly residents. I wonder if that could have any long term implications like hand sanitizer and antibiotics do. You know, by leaving some of the stronger, unsavory bits untouched, that thing gets stronger and no longer be purified by that regular dose. Super bacteria, here we come. Oh man, did I just compare me and the others unworthy of heaven to bacteria? Gotta work on that self esteem. Coming in number four, we've got Simkiel. Dangerously close to Sin Kiel, this is another remorseless, unrepentant angel. Do not put yourself in her sights lest you be utterly annihilated in seconds flat. One has to wonder how an angel becomes the chief of destruction, although I wouldn't recommend asking Simkiel anything about it. She's likely to just cash in on that title in the wildest way possible. Destruction. In addition to her first title, she also is known as the Angel of Vengeance, which works well with those predetermined traits. Destructive and vengeful seem to go hand in hand quite well. Claim revenge through destruction, destroy upon the path of vengeance. What an angel. Simkiel does spend a good amount of time in heaven, commanding other angels, but will often be called down to earth to chastise and purify sinners. Most folks have a hard enough time being chastised by their teachers and employers. Imagine a literal angel from heaven dropping in to give you an earful. My word. Plus, the way most angels purify sinners isn't pleasant. It's not just radiant light zapping you to righteousness in the same way a UV light might disinfect buffet food. You're probably getting smoten. Straight the hell with your sinful ass. She doesn't always work alone either. Many lesser angels receive Simkiel's orders and follow them with fervor. A whole platoon of vengeful, destructive angels on the lookout for sinners and sinner adjacents. I don't know about you folks watching at home, but I don't think too many righteous and pious people are watching top five scary videos. So Simkiel should be on our list of folks to avoid at all costs, as if we could even avoid her in the first place. Oh well, I guess there's only so much you can control in life. Might as well get cleansed by the good guys in the end, right? Coming in number three, we've got NCL. Working closely with Simkiel, NCL is another tough cookie straight out of the clouds. With a name meaning the constrainer, one can assume that nothing good comes from being constrained. Images of prison, the inability to move, and possibly even Stockholm Syndrome are evoked, are they not? All that being said, it's tough to think that an angel who makes regular use of constraints is anyone's safe haven. Unless you're a regular on a smutty roleplay blog, and in that case, you do you. NCL isn't all that bad though. He's often invoked to prevent forgetfulness and stupidity, which, to be honest, we could all use a hand with from time to time. However, if someone were to rely on angelic intervention regularly to keep them in line, well, what hope did they even have in the first place? Apparently, NCL is known for having a very short temper when it comes to these two traits, however, so those who need his help the most are likely to be held in contempt by him. Maybe find a new job, right? Humorless and hard to get along with, NCL is an excellent soldier. In fact, he's one of Michael's greatest warriors, which means means if anyone is ever to step to him, things will end very badly for them. Watch out and try to keep tabs on stuff you're supposed to remember. If you fail at this, you could find yourself restrained, constrained, and in NCL's bad books. Coming at number two, we've got Gabriel. Now we're talking about the big ones, the Archangels. Gabriel in particular can be a real pain to deal with. 
The youngest of the archangels, he is known as the messenger of God. He heralds major changes and brings news from the heavens. So if you run into Gabriel, you can be assured that something monumental is about to happen. You'd better listen closely though, because he doesn't suffer fools. In fact, if he senses that you're not paying close enough attention, he might just silence you forever. That's almost what happened to Zechariah. When Gabriel descended to announce the birth of John the Baptist, Zechariah initially reacted poorly. Seeing this, Gabriel got angry. So angry that he threatened to take away Zechariah's voice. He said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and bring this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Man, I can only imagine what happens when he gets into an actual argument with someone. For a being with divine powers, he sure has a short temper. Plus, as God's messenger, Gabriel is going to be the first to show up if God ever decides to call this all quits. It's more likely than you think, too. Humans are sinful and often turn to other forces these days. And in so many movies, Gabriel is the big bad guy who causes all sorts of problems for humanity. When you're the first angel to show up, you'd better believe you're going to catch a lot of folks off guard. And finally, at number one, we've got Michael. To cap off our list, the head archangel himself. He's the one powerful enough to push Lucifer out of heaven. He's the one strong enough to end the angelic war. He's the one righteous enough to prevent Samael from tearing a baby from its mother's womb. Nothing can stop Michael save for God himself, so why would he be on this list? Well, that kind of unchecked power can never be good, now can it? As the most powerful angel in creation, he has control over all of the other angels. God leaves him in his stead to rule over the kingdom of heaven. And if Michael were to ever change things up, it's unlikely that anyone would be able to do anything about it. If Michael looks down and deems our world unworthy, we're done for. Game over. The book of Revelation will come to fruition and all mortals will suffer before being cleansed from the earth. It's good to know, right? Coming in at number 5 we have Barracule. This fallen angel commanded great power but ultimately had no respect for it. Barracule is the ninth watcher and one of the leaders of the 200 fallen angels according to the book of Enoch. His name means lightning of gods, which makes sense considering it was said he taught mankind astrology. His fall from grace was the first indicator that the watchers were not complete in their wisdom. The legend goes that the watchers were dispatched to earth by god in order to oversee the human race. Consumed with lust for the beautiful daughters of men, these angels decided to abandon God's will and take them as their wives. As a result, the women gave birth to a terrifying race of unimaginable creatures, bloodthirsty giants known as Nephilim. Barakul is known for his immense strength, possessing God's holy lightning. His powers were an object of fascination for both men and angels alike, however his personality is said to be rigid and serious. He's not one for jokes as he takes them in the literal sense and apparently has a massive artistic side to him. Coming in at number 4 we have Harut and Marut. These angels are a bit of a package deal and they come from Islamic mythology. Harut and Marut unintentionally became fallen angels in an interesting bet gone wrong with God. After observing rampant sinning on earth, a group of angels began ridiculing the weakness of man. God then bet that these angels would do no better and would also give in to temptation on earth. Harut and Marut were chosen for this experiment and as soon as they descended they were seduced by beautiful women. However, a man bore witness to their sin, so the pair of angels killed him. Lovely. God gave the angels in heaven a big fat I told you so and Harut and Marut were condemned to either hell or earth to pay for the sin they committed. Honestly, earth's probably worse than hell, to be honest. They chose to be punished on earth and were hanged by their feet in a well in Babylonia until the day of judgement. Coming in at number 3 we have Arachiel. He is the fallen angel from the book of Enoch. He is the second mentioned watcher and one of the leaders of the 200 fallen angels. Also referred to as Arat Stikafa, meaning world of distortion, Arachiel is said to possess powerful geokinetic magic with the ability to literally move mountains. The name Arachiel actually means earth of God, so as an angel with a connection to earth he taught mankind to harvest the rich minerals below the ground. Safe to say this fallen angel is a powerful one. According to legends, Arachiel was an instrumental player in the uprising against heaven. Other fallen angels approached him seeking help on their quest to battle heaven. Arachiel, using his knowledge of the earth, taught mankind the signs of earth, likely meaning the art of geomancy. God learned of his treachery, sending his strongest angels to apprehend him. In an attempt to evade these agents of God, Arachiel entered his ascension form. And from that great battle grew various mountains across the planet. Whether or not he was captured is unknown, but the battle shook the very foundations of the earth. 
Coming in at number two, we have Lilith. So she's technically not a fallen angel, but Lilith did fall out of grace with God and become a prolific and powerful demon. So for that reason, she's earned a place on this list. In Jewish folklore, Lilith is considered the mother of demons, but before she held that title, she was Adam's first wife. A bit of an upgrade, don't you think? <laughs> Legend goes Lilith and Adam were created by God to live in the Garden of Eden. Lilith was ahead of her time and unwilling to be subservient to her husband, Adam. This power struggle didn't bode well for the couple. In a fit of rage, Lilith muttered the Lord's name and flew into the air, abandoning Adam. God then sent his angels to retrieve Lilith and bring her back to her husband by any means necessary. By the time they found her at the Red Sea, her rebellion grew with more fury and she refused to return. Lilith then transformed into a demon, cursed for eternity to never be able to bear children without them dying. It's not exactly the creation story we all know, but it's certainly an interesting one. Since God took away her ability to have children, it's said that Lilith is now a night demon who preys on newborn babies. Ooh. She also seduces men and is often thought of as a succubus. Lilith has become somewhat of an icon to some. She even has her own religious following called the Church of Talto. I'll join. Finally, coming in at number one, we have Abe Set the Bow. Abe Set the Bow is one of the most wicked and evil angel turned demons to fall from heaven. In the Testament of Solomon, he's said to be the son of the big bad Beelzebub, who he followed out of the gates of heaven and into the depths of hell. Abe Set the Bow introduces himself as a hostile threat to God and anyone who chooses to serve under him. During his descent from heaven, one of his great wings was ripped off and the other became a monstrous dark red wing. Full of anger and vengeance, Abe Set the Bow became the ruler of Tartarus a region of the underworld in Greek mythology created to torture wicked souls and to house banished titans. Contrary to Judeo-Christianity, Ebzethebo sheds light on the story of Exodus in the Testament of Solomon, taking credit for the turmoil that Moses endures. The one-winged demon fled to Egypt to harden the Pharaoh's heart to Moses. In turn, the Pharaoh refused to free the Hebrews. Ebzethebo then followed Moses and the Israelites. With the army, he convinced the Pharaoh to send, but they were ultimately drowned in the Red Sea, leaving this demon trapped in a pillar of air. As a skilled sorcerer, he's considered a master of performing miracles and wonders and has the ability to share these powers with anyone. Said that Abe Zethebo is most easily summoned in the month of July. Sick. But I would not recommend giving that a try, but I probably might, so I'll let you know how it goes. No time like the present, am I right? July 14, me up. Number five on this list is the story of Lilith. Lilith is a demonic figure in Judaic mythology. She's often regarded and mentioned to in Biblical Hebrew as being Adam's first wife before Eve came into the picture. Now, Lilith is assumed to be Adam's first wife due to how she came to being. Adam was formed from the clay and soil of the earth and he is noted as being just slightly lower than an angel. Lilith was said to be formed in the same way from the same earth. So I suppose this entry is a little off because she was slightly lower than an angel, but I think it's close enough. Now, Lilith would have been intended to play the role of Eve, but that wasn't her style. I mean, she is a demon after all. She refused to bend to Adam's will and was not subservient to her husband. She decided then that this whole ruse of being his wife was enough for her and that it was finally time to embrace her true designation of being a demon. Therefore, she abandoned the Garden of Eden and left Adam to his own devices. Several angels attempted to stop her from going, but her mind was made up and her true identity was revealed. She also tells these three angels that came after her when they find her at the Red Sea that her main purpose in life is to devour children. Now granted, Adam was being pretty ridiculous in some of the stuff that he requested from Lilith. However, to go from Adam's wife to a child devouring demon is a pretty sizable fall. I suppose in this story she pretended to be an angel for as long as she could until she couldn't stand it anymore and changed into her true form of being a demon. Number four is from the manga series that was later turned into the popular anime series called Death Note. Death Note is considered by some to be the best anime series ever made and it's extremely highly ranked on major anime lovers lists. The story is centered around a high school whose name is Light Yagami. Light is a prodigy among his peers and it is very 
clearly established that he's extremely intelligent. The inciting incident of this show is when he discovers a book which is called The Death Note. This book grants the holder the ability to kill anyone in the entire planet with a few caveats. The person you intend to target, you have to know their full name and you also have to have their face in mind when you are writing their name down. Having their face in mind makes it so that you're incapable of killing everyone who shares the same name as that person, but only that specific individual will die. Now this book doesn't come alone. In fact, you get a pretty interesting individual tagging along with it. For every death note, there is also a Shinigami, or a death god. In this specific case, the death god that we encounter is named Ryuk. Now Ryuk is very clearly a god of death, and I think some could certainly refer to him as a demon, as his main purpose is to take the life of humans. However, in this show, he along with another Shinigami certainly seem to take on the role of guardian angels. The owner of their death note seeks the benefit of their advice and these Shinigami often end up helping these individuals. However, the true intentions of Ryuk is very clearly to toy with humans and every time he helps Light Yagami, it is only ever to suit the interest of himself in the long run. These Shinigami paint the picture that their death notes are a great gift, but in the end of the day, they are demons who are looking for any way possible to cause trouble. Number three on this list is the serpent from Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is a very famous biblical tale about the apparent first man and first woman to ever roam the earth. After seven days of creating the universe, God came down to earth and made the most beautiful garden in the world called the Garden of Eden. After that, he formed Adam, the first man to ever take to the earth and the caretaker of this beautiful garden that he had just created. He told Adam that he had the freedom to swim the water, climb the trees, eat the fruits, and explore the entire garden in all of its beauty. The one important rule that he gave to Adam was to never eat from a very specific apple tree in the middle of the garden. After he gave these instructions to Adam, he thought that Adam may be rather lonely and deserve some company. Considering Adam's apparent first wife turned out to be a demon, God decided to make Eve, and she was said to be the first woman to ever come to earth. Now, it is told that one day the pair was walking through the beautiful garden God had created and passing by the forbidden apple tree. Dangling down from the tree was the most pristine apple that you would have ever seen and looked extremely enticing. Knowing though that they weren't supposed to have it, they carried on, but before they could leave, they were stopped by a snake dangling from the branches of that forbidden tree. The snake tells them to have a bite of the apple, tricking them into disobeying God's wishes. He goes on to say that if you were to eat this apple, then you would have the knowledge of God himself. Something very tempting indeed. The pair inevitably cave into the snake and go against God's wishes. God discovers their treachery and banishes them from the Garden of Eden. Now this snake has been tied to Satan for centuries, with many people believing that he transformed into a snake to trick them. I also realize that a snake is not the typical image of an angel that one may have in mind, but if someone was to grant me a magical fruit that gave me the knowledge of God, I would consider them to be pretty angelic. Number two on this list is the story of a young girl named Jamie. Jamie was a seven year old girl who believed that she had a guardian angel as an imaginary friend. She talked about this imaginary friend to her parents very regularly and the parents, I mean they didn't think anything of it, only that their daughter had a very active imagination. Well as it would later be found out, Jamie's imaginary friend wasn't a guardian angel at all, but a demon that was simply pretending to be one. It started with little things, innocent, childlike things. Jamie would go into the cabinets and steal some extra treats without her parents looking. And if she was caught doing so, she would claim that her guardian angel or her imaginary friend told her to. Obviously this wasn't an acceptable excuse for her parents as they couldn't see any physical representation of this imaginary friend and had no way of knowing if Jamie was telling the truth or not. The problem started to escalate though, from the innocent extra cookie to problems at school. Jamie started being exceptionally rude to her classmates, even getting in some unprovoked fights at school. She went from a happy young girl to an angry, depressed version of herself, a pretty unfamiliar sight for a seven year old. Finally, everything culminated when one day the parents couldn't find the family cat. 
They found her dead outside in the backyard with clear evidence that it was Jamie's doing. They immediately sprung to action and got her help from medical professionals who could deal with something of this sort. It was revealed through some extensive therapy that Jamie's imaginary friend was actually a demon pretending to be a guardian angel when really it just intended to incite chaos. Now it is currently unknown if this was a true demon or if Jamie herself struggled with some serious mental health concerns that had her believing this was the case. Either way, one thing is for sure, whatever it was, wasn't looking out for her best interests. Number one on this list is actually the devil himself. Now it is widely believed that the devil did not start off as simply the manifestation of evil, but was actually a beautiful angel named Lucifer. Lucifer did not stay this beautiful angel for long though, eventually being cast out by God due to his treachery. He became infatuated with himself, believing that he was the most beautiful, intelligent, powerful creature that has come to being and thought that he deserved the power that God wielded. This didn't go well with God, obviously, and he cast him down to earth, banishing him from heaven. Lucifer then made his life mission to sabotage the word of God and incite chaos upon the earth, taking on the role of the devil as we know him today. Now, not only did Lucifer start off his life as an angel, but he has also gone on to impersonate them many times since then. I've already spoken about the story of Adam and Eve where it's believed he is the snake that tricks the first two humans to eat the apple. It is also widely thought that Satan can imitate an angel of light. This is something that he has done since his inception. Even to this day there are stories that people believed that they've had encounters with Satan or Lucifer as a completely different entity than what we may expect him to appear as. This is obviously extremely dangerous because if an angel of light appeared in front of me and told me to do something, I would feel pretty obligated to do it. Coming in at number five, we've got God's angels from Legion. You know that old notion of a kind and loving God? Well, that's not happening in this movie. No siree. Apparently at some point around 2010, God gave up on humanity and said, it. We've done the whole dividing up of languages so nobody can understand each other. We've done the worldwide flood for a hard reset. What's the way we're going to take down humanity this time? Ah, that's right. Heavenly warfare against folks that have a snowflake's chance in hella surviving. That is the premise of Legion. God is pissed, so he sends his angelic armies to kill every human on earth. That is bleak. And they're not like raising people with arrows of light or rapturing up folks real high and then dropping them down. They are stepping right up to the citizens of Earth and tearing them to pieces. It is not a pretty sight. Of course, we kick it all off with an insane grandmother letting a pregnant mom know her baby's gonna burn in hell. She then proceeds to bite a gaping hole in a man's neck and climb all over the walls like a geriatric Spider-Man. Hot start. While that may be the scariest thing that happens here, we've got horde after horde of terrifying angels ready to rain hellfire upon a dusty diner in the middle of nowhere. The winged warriors descend upon this tiny town like swarms of locusts, tearing up anything they can. There are also actual locusts too, just in case you're worried. It is an insurmountable challenge to face down these creatures while keeping humanity's last hope, an unborn child, alive, but Archangel Michael descends to Earth to make it happen. It's a blood pumping action movie with plenty of horrific scenes. What's not to love? Plus there's that classic bit with the sketchy ice cream man. God, what an image. The wide mouthed, spindly limbed dude in a yellow uniform scuttling towards you at top speed. Isn't exactly a movie meant to be taken seriously, but boy, is it fun. Coming in at number four, we've got the guardian angel from a dark song. In the end, this angel did do exactly what it was supposed to do, but all the stuff that led up to its appearance was harrowing. Plus, let's be real, summoning a guardian angel through torture and bloodshed and then having it smite your enemies doesn't seem like something a holy and good person would do. If you're unfamiliar with a dark song, we'll summarize it now. After losing her young son, a grieving widow decides to rent a secluded house in Wales. She spends her time there alone, dealing with great sorrow. However, she's got an ulterior motive for being there. She wants to convince a famous occultist to guide her through a ritual to allow her to speak to her son once more. This requires the summoning of a guardian angel who will somehow bring her son's spirit to her. Now, The ritual requires a whole lot of commitment, and that the two stay indoors the entire time. This sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it is. 
this. The occultist is a bit of a skis ball, and after the mother refuses to perform a rite of forgiveness, among other things, things go a little sideways. They manipulate and each other for a while but fall into some daily routines and become familiar over time. However, the mother has been keeping a secret. She hasn't been totally honest and is really performing the ritual to get revenge on the person who kidnapped and killed her son. So whenever this angel comes, it won't be one of forgiveness and healing. It will be an angel of vengeance and death. Yikes. With this realization, things get a whole lot worse. To summon this angel, the mother must be killed and reborn, and the occultist sustains a festering wound. Demons begin to infest the house and drive the mother to madness. But in the end, the angel does indeed appear, both glorious and horrifying. But was it worth it? Well, I suppose that's up to the viewer. Would you be able to muster up the strength to forgive the person who killed your child after a life-altering ordeal? That's a tough one. Coming in at number 3 we've got Gabriel from The Prophecy. If Christopher Walken playing the role of an evil angel waging a war against God doesn't get you to watch a movie, uh, I don't know what to tell you. This 1995 religious thriller launched a whole series of sequels all concerning Archangel Gabriel's many issues with the way things are being run up top. In this flick, Gabriel is full of tricks, malice, and violence. When an angel can descend from heaven and steal souls from evil individuals to turn the tide of a celestial war, you'd better watch out. He's just so perfectly creepy as he slinks around, mercilessly killing people and attempting to kidnap children. Gabriel does not shy away from torture, nor does he feel the slightest bit bad stealing the souls of people to push his own goals forward. All because God didn't listen to him more. Although that arrogance would eventually be his downfall, he caused a whole lot of chaos in his brief time on earth, and had he succeeded, heaven would have become a second hell. Now isn't that a terrifying proposition? Coming in at number 2 we've got the fallen angels from Gabriel. We just talked about Gabriel the character in another movie, now we're going to talk about Gabriel the movie. In a post apocalyptic vision of heavenly warfare we enter purgatory which is now corrupted by evil. This forces it to take on the form of a seedy rundown city where angels and fallen angels must take the forms of humans to exist. This exposes them to human faults and desires. These traits prove much more damaging to angels over time as the fallen angels gain strength from all that debauchery. At times, it's easy to forget that you're watching a movie about angels at all. In the rundown city, every vice possible is there and super exploited. It hinges on absurdity at times, to be honest. These angels and fallen angels indulge in every possible vice and do it to the extreme. We've got angels living in the back of broken down buses, drinking themselves to death. We've got beautiful angels being drugged and employed at brothels. There are people being forcibly given plastic surgery to look exactly like their vain captors and then used as slaves. There are nightclubs full of synthetic drugs to placate and pacify powerful deities. The world is richly imagined, don't get me wrong, and feels like something straight out of an edgy 80s comic book. But these angels and fallen angels hanging out in purgatory are definitely not ones you want to cross, lest you end up a personal pleasure servant or a junkie in a back alley. And finally at number 1 we've got Angels from Jacob's Ladder. Before the 1990 horror gem and even before the popular carnival climbing game, Jacob's Ladder was essentially a stairway to heaven detailed in religious texts. Originally cited in a dream by biblical patriarch Jacob, it has been used as a symbol for ascension and more. This vision is very different from what Jacob Singer sees in the movie movie, but there are many parallels here. After returning from war, Jacob starts experiencing terrifying visions in his day to day life. He reaches out to fellow veterans who seem to be having similar experiences. However, the visions intensify and Jacob has trouble separating these supposed hallucinations from reality. Is it that he and his comrades were experimented on by the military, or were they experiencing mental issues before even being cleared for combat? Could it be that these visions are visions from angels, similar to the biblical Jacobs? There is a scene in the movie where a 14th century Christian mystic Meister Eckhart is quoted. He says the only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of life, your memories, your attachments. They burn them all away, but they're not punishing you, they're freeing your soul. So if you're frightened of dying and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. But if you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. So could these terrifying visions that are slowly degrading Jacob down to nothing actually be 
angels? It's hard to say, especially when we also learn that Jacob's unit was secretly drugged with a substance meant to increase aggression before heading into combat. So maybe Jacob really was dead the whole time, feeling the effects of the drug leave his body as his life also fades away. Or maybe his death meant that he had to wrestle with angels and demons before being able to move on. Coming in at number 5, the Weeping Angel. She resides in a cemetery in Rome, starting out as a statue for his late wife by the sculptor William Westmore Story. The Weeping Angel became much more than that. Yes, she might not technically be an angel, but due to this, this has been the name given to her. After William died a year after creating the sculpture, it was reported that many often heard crying in the cemetery. The crying would instantly stop when you looked at the angel. She is an angel of grief and therefore her spirit is not a peaceful one. It is said that with a single touch a weeping angel can send a person into the past to a point before their own birth and can then feed off the potential energy of the years which that victim would have lived in the present. If you think you have come across the weeping angel, make sure not to blink. If you look at her, she is harmless but looking away may be deadly. Coming in at number 4 we have Lucifer. So impressed with his own beauty, intelligence and power, Lucifer wanted to possess all the power of God. His greed led to him being banished from heaven. He became the lord of hell but he did not choose to stay there. It is said that Lucifer chose to walk to earth, spreading his greed. He is said to bring out the worst in humanity and takes many forms to do this. Many people on earth worship Lucifer. It is said that if you make an offering to him that includes suffering to others, he will reward you with whatever it is you seek. We can see many examples of this in history including the Manson family. It is said that they are attempting to perform rituals and offerings to Lucifer to do his bidding to gain more power. Around this time many murder scenes would have satanic symbols indicating their attempts to contact or please Lucifer. Looking through history you can see the damage he has done through others and he will continue to have his presence here on earth. In at number 3 we have Beelzebub. Beelzebub is one of the seven princes of hell who have the highest authority in hell. His name translates to the lord of flies. Like Lucifer he too was cast from hell. It is said that Beelzebub desires to bring on wars and cause men to begin worshipping demons. His name as lord of flies comes from him spreading disease. Spreading death and disease over earth has gained him a high honour in hell and is known as the second ranking of the many fallen angels. His spirit causes people to resort to warlike tendencies where they usually would not. Much like in the book Lord of the Flies when his presence is around people will begin fighting each other for land or food or really anything that they can. It is not known what brings his spirit out but he seems to find people at their most vulnerable in need or help to turn against each other. Could he be responsible for all the wars in the world? We may never know. In at number 2 we have Azrael. Azrael is more commonly known as the angel of death arguably the most important of all the angels on earth but also the most terrifying. One of four archangels he is responsible for separating people's souls from their mortal form. Most people will only ever meet Azrael once in their lifetime but others may not be so lucky. It is said that when you're next on his list he will follow you like a shadow until your time has ended. If you somehow evade him he will begin to hunt you down to carry out his task. There are people who believe they can communicate with and see Azrael. There are those like the late Greta Alexander who claims they were able to communicate with the angel of death leading to the discovery of bodies from closed police files that otherwise would never have been found. Others turn to Ouija boards to attempt to contact the angel, something that I would not recommend with many films showing how this can go very very wrong. Hard facts right there. And last but definitely not least we have Moloch. Moloch is also a fallen angel here on earth. Any mention of Moloch is highly condemned due to its terrifying nature. From what we do know about Moloch they are a being that demands or requires a very costly sacrifice and that sacrifice is a person's soul. It is unclear why they demand this sacrifice but many cults around the world believe and worship Moloch. To sacrifice a person to Moloch you must use a flame, much like the sacrifice from Stannis in Game of Thrones. There are also horrifying mentions of eating people in some instances. To make this sacrifice it must be your first person born. A middle person is safe. There does not seem to be much written on what Moloch grants you after this ritual, but nothing can be worth that. 